Here we go. Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Christina. I'm one of the owners at A Novel Idea. Um, I am still in the shop, which is uh, why I'm wearing a mask and sitting under an AC unit. <laughs> so you could see the shop. Um, but we're so, so excited to have Reagan and Lanny with us today to talk about both of their books. Um, I Give me a second, I will be able to show you them. They're both available at A Novel Idea. So we have Lanny's Good Morning to Everyone Except Men Who Named Their Dog Zeus, still one of my favorite titles ever for a book, um, and then Head of Gorgon by Reagan. So they're going to read from their books, they're going to talk about their books, and they're also going to take questions from all of you. Um, so feel free at any point to drop any questions into the chat, um, but there will also be a chance where you can unmute yourself and ask questions as well. Um, and then uh, I'll also drop just the bookstore email if you're interested in ordering these. We do ship them. Um, otherwise, thanks so much for being here, and um, I will be here, but uh, I will pop back on at the end. So without further ado, welcome Reagan and Lanny. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so much. So um, I guess, do you want me to start? I do. Okay. <laughs> I would love it if you started. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start, but technically um, Lanny is going to also start, but we'll get to that. So um, I just wanted to thank um, Christina and A Novel Idea for the opportunity. Um, I am only doing virtual events because this is still a pandemic and I have uh, health things going on. So um, this, this type of opportunity to be able to reach people um, that are far near and far uh, means a lot to me. So thank you for that. And thanks, of course, to Lanny for joining me today. And, um, you know, I, I'm so excited because our, our work has so many um, overlaps and yet also diversions as well, um, even though we're talking about, um, you know, bad Greek dudes. Um, <laughs> But uh, thank you for, for coming. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, me and then the, the myth that I'm kind of covering and then sort of a, a description of what the plan is before I turn it over to Lanny, who's going to start us off. So um, I'm Reagan. I write, I edit, I consult, um, and I'm here today to share my work from my latest collection, which is my debut full length, Head of a Gorgon. Um, and uh, this is based on the, the myth of Medusa from the perspective of the, the versions that basically consider Poseidon as a rapist. So um, Poseidon rapes Medusa on the altar of Athena. And then from that point, uh, Athena punishes Medusa by turning her into this horrible monster with snakes for hair and other bodily defigurements. So um, that's the foundational version of the myth that I'm working from. Then I reimagine that in contemporary times. Um, so because of the nature of my work and Lanny's work, um, I do want to do just a general trigger warning. Um, we talk very openly about sexual violence. Um, so if that is triggering for you, um, please either mute us or um, find resources, have resources available to you. Um, I, I can provide resources in the chat at, at, at a later point if anybody wants to just like raise a hand or put something in the chat that you need resources. I have resources at the end of at the back of my book that I can drop in there for you so that um, you can reach out to people and connect with people if you are if you feel triggered by any of the work. But because there's so much overlap between my and my and Lanny's work, I wanted to do something kind of unusual um, for this reading, which is basically toggle back and forth. Um, as I was reading her book, it made me think of different poems in my book, whether it was a, an image or a certain kind of um, thread or concept overall uh, perspective she was taking that I, that I immediately kind of connected one of my poems or someone else's poems with. So we're going to do kind of like an alternating back and forth thing. And if you have both of the books or any, either one, um, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to try to remember the page to say the page numbers. Lanny's probably going to be better at it than I am. But we're going to go back and forth with the page numbers and go between us 
with these poems. Now, this is a surprise for Lanny. She knew that we were going to take this approach, but she does not know the poems that I've selected on my end. So um, I'm going to do, after she reads one of her poems, I'm going to kind of explain why I picked the following poem and then read that poem. And we'll keep doing that until the end. So Lanny, that's you. Thank you. Yeah, perfect introduction. I'm really excited about this back and forth conversation that we're about to have. Um, and just so everyone knows, I requested that Reagan not tell me which poem she was going to read so that I can be uh, right there with, with you all. And I'll be following along in my copy of Reagan's book. Um, so I, I want to start with thanking a novel idea for letting us do that. Um, the, Reagan had this brilliant idea to come together since our work is, is so similar um, and already talks to each other. And I'm just very excited to have this space that they've allowed. So thank you so much. Um, I am going to read from my book, Good Morning to Everyone Except Men Who Named Their Dog Zeus. Um, like Reagan said, trigger warning, sexual violence. And um, the this started from an idea of I, I dated a couple of guys whose dogs named were Zeus, and I was like, well, that's that's weird. Why would you name your dog after a sexual predator? What are you trying to say? Um, and, and once I had this idea formed, like what's going on, then I started noticing other men with dogs named Zeus. And then I started vocalizing on Twitter and people started coming to me saying, hey, my uncle has a dog named Zeus or my dad or my, my ex-boyfriend. And I would follow up with like, well, how do they treat women? Do you like this guy? And it never, like, I don't think I've ever had an answer like, oh yeah, he's a good dude. So um, I'm not saying that um, every man with a dog named Zeus is a terrible guy. I'm just saying, stop and think about it for a moment. Like, why did they name their dog that? And um, so from that idea, I started writing um, poems um, about Zeus and how he has raped these women and men. Um, and then I decided to get a little more personal and talk about my own sexual assault. Um, so I have poems in here about that as well and just kind of blending them because I think to get get the effect that I wanted, I needed to be more personal. And so I, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and start with page 35. In this Olympian house, we suckle at the teat of a nanny goat, nourishing our lucent bodies until we are swole and tyrannical. In this Olympian house, we are both the youngest and eldest siblings, crowing grandfathers and bawling children. In this Olympian house, we wield lightning bolts like we're in the throes of puberty and the bathroom door is locked. In this Olympian house, we disguise ourselves as animals, fuck every woman we see licking at dalliance or entanglement or conquest, but never rape. In this Olympian house, we swallow our first wives to avoid patricide, but our daughters still spring forth from her father's skull. In this Olympian house, we marry our sisters, call them snacks. In this Olympian house, we punish a thief whose only crime was keeping his family warm by chaining him to a rock and sicking eagles on his liver. In this Olympian house, we gulp our children down like eggs, one by one, until there is no one left to challenge the skies, the seas, and the pits of inevitable hell. So there was, um, there was a sense of just incredible doom when I read that poem um, and just thought about the the deep flaws of the gods, whether real, imagined, reimagined. And so I chose this poem, um, Your Captain Speaking, which is page 11 in my book, um, to sort of go along with or be in conversation with uh, Lanny's poem. Who cares what other stories have told you? The water forged you. Now your head's in a sack, no sign of light. Is your life a blessing or curse, you ask? 
who retains the right to name. Red devil, your mother's mouth spit water, dreamed only of devouring God, your father, before a wave suffocated her. A kind of flailing was involved. You don't remember. Tell you another story. Red devil, your father, dreamed only of commanding water, maimed the gates of God, your mother, before his wings were steeped, spent. A kind of flailing was involved. You don't understand. Tell you another story. One day you dream of freedom, crack, click a scaly beak in search of a medium to breathe. But the water's already grown bored, broke and mobilized around you, its gaze clear. A kind of flailing will be involved. There is no other story. Best to never be, but here you are, and the swells are hissing. This water was never hesitating, just building and building, then unzipping, snickering at you the prey it ached to drown in its dark. The swells are hissing, but the water's already grown bored. I love those lines, Reagan. Thank you. So I decided to to start off the first couple of poems that I'm going to read here are more like a encompass, encompassing um, the Olympians, the the gods, and then I'll I'll get a little more specific into the the Zeus myths. But this next one is a god is not a good man, though our mothers teach us how to press our rage against fists the great muffler of grief. Sometimes a man kneads his way into soft palms and is stunned to find callousness there. He takes a virgin and mutates her into parable. How, if a woman cannot sense the beast in the gentle animal, the beast will burrow himself into the gentle woman. A man may be tempted to lie in the grass ready to swagger, ready to strike. He will do this to prove his godliness, the reaving of an innocent, rather than leave her working in the fields untouched. Yeah, that, it was so strange reading this poem and, and seeing the words burrowing and the, the snake-like imagery um, and it's it's such a powerful piece. Um, it reminded me of um, my poem on page 34, which is part of a dialogue series between Medusa and Poseidon. Um, this is uh, the poem that depicts uh, Poseidon raping Medusa. And it's called uh, Lesson at the Ranch. So there's fields in both of these poems. And yeah, I guess, Lanny has been asked if we have collaborated on our work. And for those who weren't here earlier in the discussion, we, we did not, we did not know each other um, until recently. And so it's just strange and uncanny to have these types of overlaps. So here's lesson at the ranch. What desert reminds me, secrets can hide from outsiders, but not from my body. Its curves consumed by sand, heels up to thighs, back and clinging sweaty to my neck. What if I say more? Cows don't know they're fed fat for slaughter. Their calves will forget them. This knowledge won't change the patchwork of hide and land that cloaks daily affairs like the quilt you lie over, not under us, gnats swimming in our humidity. What desert reminds me? Secrets can hide from outsiders, but for how long? The hurts my mouth blurts, betray but don't end your quest. The sand is shadowing, turning a bolder version of itself. You're bolstered over me, stained by sweat, sun, dusty stalks of electrified straw. The sun falls and all I can do is try to find something sharper than the pain. Clouds above unravel sky like hides ripped, revealing the red of an animal I can't name. After, I sit in a tub with no water. Then I sit on a porch. It's morning once more. A herd speaks from the distance, too far to see. The land remembers its lot and feeds it. The earth remembers its purpose, continues to break beneath teeth. Ooh. 
Um, I really like the the line revealing the red of an animal I can't name. Uh, it's just it's so visceral. It ended up being the title of my chat book. <laughs> Thank you. And speaking of um, the Sealy Challenge is next month, and typically that is um, reserved for chat books. But both of our full lengths here are actually sh on the shorter side, and quick reads if you don't consider the heavy content. Um, so I would definitely suggest getting either or both of these books for the Sealy Challenge, which is, uh, if you don't know, reading one chat book or short book a day of poems for the month of August. So moving on, I am going to read the very first poem in this, this collection, which I think sets the tone for everything in the entire book. This is called Lita. If you've ever seen swans fuck, you'd know it's a folded napkin in a dither while a second lays flat, soiled, praying for dinner to end. The male tops the female in a fresh water body. She must float them both. She is submerged beak beneath the ripples, lost to the jaw around her noose-length neck. The deed lasts eight seconds. After, he glides to the edge of the pond, distancing himself from her, while she honks, reaching back, trying also to rid herself of him. Zeus appeared to Leta as a swan, then raped her. So one thing that I admire about Lanny's work in particular is it really just cuts right through. Um, it just, it's like, just does not beat around the bush. <laughs> it's just very direct. And I think um, it's very important um, with this type of subject, especially given how other people, namely men, like to retell and repaint these scenarios. Um, but like Lanny said in the poem, you know, the, the woman has to float them both, right? Um, and that's not a good thing, and it should not be the way it is. Um, thinking about how uh, men render women um, literally and metaphorically, the next poem that I picked to pair uh, with Lanny's poem is on page 29 of my book. It's called your captain speaking, and it's one of three poems titled that. Um, this is a particular narrator persona in this book. So this is the next of that same narrator. The men of nets have their ways. Wives and daughters play their part, weave so husbands and sons can leave at dawn, sweep salted waters with lengths of trains that callous their hands. Poverty is obvious. It's the crisp of skin peeling off the sunburned leather of a sea weathered neck, the stink of fish too deep beneath the nails to be breached. The way captives will always be clubbed in their traps as if all smaller creatures were made simply to pay a penance. The flimsy body buckling, conferring blood, delivering one last flail after the strike that finally breaks it arrives. There is hunger, too much hunger. Who knows where it comes from? The day you meet him, your insides grind against themselves. He lumbers under a palpable weight of fish from that water, wet iridescent prizes glistening. You pray they'll crush you. They will. The moment your teeth gnash meat, you christen him your Lord. Wow. Oh my gosh. Um, the imagery of the way captives will always be clubbed in their traps like there's no escape and just i love i love that you're talking about the sea and you know poseidon is the god of the sea and like even though his name isn't mentioned in this poem it's like ah uh, yeah okay we know who you're talking about <laughs> yeah, i think it's my favorite oh thank you um also I keep thinking about 
your introduction uh, to this whole thing and to your book and how you said that Poseidon raped Medusa and to punish Medusa, um, who was Athena, Athena turned her into, you know, like gave her the snake hair and, and like pun punished her for what? For because it happened in her, you know, like yeah, yeah. It happened in her her temple, but obviously it was Medusa's fault. Yeah, but you know, it it ha actually kind of plays into that whole thing that both of our books um, bring up, which is that you know, there's there are the males that are the predators, but then there's also these female figures that are the enablers. Yep, um, and I think that's really kind of critical to mention as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, so the next poem is a found poem and I found this, um, this section from the effects of a lightning strike on the human body from all that's interesting.com. And there's a lot of lightning imagery in my book. And I decided, okay, well, what if every time the word lightning appears, I substitute it for the word rape? And so that's what this is, the effects of lightning on the human body. Like a gunshot, it causes both exit and entrance wound, marking the victim. White, hot substances burn, clothing shredded, shoes and socks thrown off. Many survivors do not remember being struck. The only evidence is burnt, displaced clothing and marks along the body. It will cook brain cells, rendering them useless, memory issues, trouble with concentration, severe headaches, all of which lasts decades after the initial strike. One thing that Lanny does that's really interesting, and I'm still kind of thinking on it, um, even in revisiting her book several times, is there There are spaces within the, the book where she explores this concept of lightning. It's They're, they're like these sort of interludes, um, but very interesting. So Zeus obviously having the thunderbolts, that's his sort of jam. So, um, you know, we, we see how she plays with these concepts um, literally and figuratively and how that lightning then comes to affect a, 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 a form, a, a figure, a body um, as something that can't be removed from it. Um, so the poem that in my collection sort of spoke to that, I thought was the, the poem where I sort of imagine Medusa's physical transformation um, kind of embodied in a more contemporary way, but also carrying some of the, the original myths uh, transformations. So this is, I think it's a six part poem uh, on page 37, it's called Transfiguration. One, duplicitous blood. Once my blood moved nothing like red, then ache cut down to the veins, over through the blue liquid my body breathes through. Now that fickle drip sticks beneath my skin in purpled pools, confused, seeking a new refuge, as if water or wine could take its place, as if the sun could stretch far enough to touch and warm me, as if red could travel far enough back to resurrect a girl felled in the grass at sunset. Two, defeated wings. My back strains beneath the weight of a black broke divinity. Holy leaves flap in the breeze, but their words don't restore me. I can't flee this body. My mind can't find a peak to soar to. The weight of memory tethers me. Three, unblinking eyes. I'd saved my gaze to search for a hero, only to find another predator's conceit. Now salt singes my sockets. Vigilant beacons forget the comfort of closing, refuse any respite from their watch. Four, hardened hands. Foolish digits will forget how they almost submitted, cringe at the thought that they once sought another's. Battle bruised knuckles proved useless, shriek as they bend. 
a new mold must be poured. I swim my hands in. To burn in guilt now might make me invincible once the heat's depleted. Five, forking tongue. They might say with this spoiled mouth I slander, but they split me. My tongue senses the stench they left in stereo. Trespassers treading the end of this plank, you're the venom I retch from. Six, snaking mane. No body could bear such warfare. My head delivers riddles of persistent hisses, forbidden liberation for so long. Twisted hair springs, slithers, claims my scalp's terrain and crowns my fate. Thanks to these men, the oblivious birth of my serpents. What spoke to me the most in that is I can't flee this body. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we <laughs> could just say, nope, uh, new body, please. Uh, this one reminds me of bad things. Um, and we wouldn't have to go through therapy, years of therapy. We wouldn't have to sit with that just terrible feeling in your gut when you recognize the the signs of, of another predator, right? And you can't you can't say, hey, watch out for that, that guy, because no one believes you. No one's listening. So that really spoke to me. Um, the, uh, the next one is where I start getting a little more personal. Um, my, uh, my mother, she had a lot of guys in and out of the house when I was growing up. Like she liked to she liked to save people. She liked to protect people. And, um, but that just meant that I had a lot of strangers coming in and out of the home. And so <laughs> this poem is page 23, because I, I keep forgetting to give the page numbers, even though Reagan said I was going to be good at it. I'm not. Um, this is called, My Mother Deftly Misses the Point. I tell her, Billy stares at me. Billy of the ponytail, of the chatter, of the unpaid rent. Billy, the virtual stranger whom I beg my mother not to invite to Thanksgiving. He may have a lazy eye, she theorizes. Billy of the eyes I know are blue and alert because of how often I find them across the room and on my ass. I tell her, I won't come to dinner if Billy is there. She ignores the ultimatum and asks, are you sure you don't mean Tim? Man, I, when I first read this poem, I, I just, I mean, the, so you, you, this is another thing that you do really well is the, just that biting sort of humor, but like not, it's like funny, but not, but is, but isn't. Um, you do that really well. Um, and it's just, you capture the mother figure in this poem so, so strikingly because th there's always an excuse with these, these women enablers. There's always some justification or some excuse. Yeah. Um, in, in my mother poem, uh, cause the mother figures into my book as well. Um, there's this, uh, I, I also kind of explore, um, I, I'm, I was brought up Roman Catholic. So I kind of play with the concept of prayer. So you might notice some similarities to the prayers, um, Hail Mary and Our Father within this next poem, um, but just kind of exploring this, this idea of what the women in our lives who ultimately fail us, um, you know, again, real or imagined, um, you know, this, this way that they, they enable the, the constant predation. Um, so this is on page 20 and it's called Pray. Hail mother, fueled to erase, my words are with thee. Secret arts now uncovered, wickedness muted by thy tune ceaseless. Rotten daughter, your false confession drops now with this page. The time has come, thy will be done. Cleave hurts with opposing motion. Give me this way your illuminating dread and deliver bits of sin into water as we shiver in nightgowns through this baptism. I'll seed each, pray for their transfiguration into an illegible whirlpool. 
holy mother, loather of the flawed, I'll retain your blessed lesson. Trust no one now or at any hour of my remaining breaths. I can just hear Athena looking down on Medusa and saying, rotten daughter, you know? Oh, geez. Um, so the, uh, the next poem that I'll read is, uh, is the closest thing I have to explaining the, the title of the book without explaining the title of the book. And this is, uh, God help us, another douchebag has named his dog Zeus. A puppy nips at his owner's fingers and is not reprimanded because dogs will be dogs. The gangly puppy, two large paws, soon will fuck the neighborhood bitches. He can smell the heat between their legs and does not yet care to master his senses. And the puppy swells into full-grown mutt who rejects commands like wait and no, but will roll over an unconscious body behind a dumpster and come. So if anyone is familiar with Brock Turner, um, you will you'll recognize the ending of that poem. I just this one too with the dogs will be dogs like there's always there's always some excuse for the behavior yep. right um so I, I actually for this one I wanted to visit um Marie Howe who writes about um her survivorship and what the living do and some of her other work um there's a poem especially right now given the the war situation um although this there doesn't have to be a war for this to happen, but she touches on war in this poem. Um, but there are some similarities here with these, these sort of excuses that people just, oh, dogs will be dogs, will they? Um, this one's called In the Movies. When a man rapes a woman because he's a soldier and his army's won, there's always somebody else holding her down, another man. So the men do it together or one after the other. In the way my brother shot hoops on the driveway with their friends while we girls watched. Their favorite game was pig. A boy had to make the exact shot as the boy before him, or he was a P-I-G consecutively until he lost. I've been thinking about the sorrow of men and how it's different from the sorrow of women, although I don't know how. In the movies, one soldier holds the woman down, his hand over her mouth, and another soldier or two holds down the husband who's enraged and screaming because he can't help the woman he loves. When the soldiers go, he crawls across the dirt and grass to reach his wife who's speaking gibberish now. He kisses her cheek over and over again. The woman lives on. We see her years later, answering a man's questions in the drawing room, a crescent scar just above her lace collar. She's dignified and serene. Maybe her son has been recently killed. Maybe she's successfully married a daughter. How can a woman love a man? In the movies, a man rapes a woman because he's a soldier and his army's won, and he wants to celebrate all those nights in the dark and the mud. And there's always someone else holding her down, another soldier or a friend. So the men seem to do it together. I don't really have much to say about that one, except I'm very angry now. <laughs> I was just feeling anger rise from my belly to my throat, to my cheeks. There's always another soldier helping. Like, oh my God, Reagan. Yeah, she's, her work is amazing. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but I, mm -hmm. I she's very, she's got that very direct way of, of speaking in her poems the way that, that I think you do as well. So you might enjoy her work. Well, enjoy is not quite the term, but appreciate maybe, connect with. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind um, linking me to her work in, uh, on Twitter, since you yeah. and I have a conversation going. Sure. <clears throat> 
So um, this, this next poem, to bring a little joy into the room, um, I found out the the plural to Cyclops is Cyclopes, and it just made me really happy. So I wrote a poem about um, or using Cyclopes. The poem, of course, isn't that happy, but just remember the moment I discovered the plural of Cyclops is Cyclopes. I was just like, ah, it's so cute. I love it. So just hold on to that because <laughs> I will. The plural of Cyclops is Cyclopes. This is page 45. A girl can carry her drink to the bathroom or a friend can guard it within her wool. She can spot and uproot red flags like a row of Washington apples. A girl can call an Uber or substitute water for undiluted wine. A girl can travel in a flock or tuck keys between her knuckles like Hellenistic soldiers. She can even master Krav Maga and the myth of prevention. A girl can occupy a bar stool all night long with a vigilant eye on her glass. But when the safe kit is processed in the morning, police will insist there is nobody to blame. Yeah, that myth of prevention. Myth um, of prevention. Yeah, that, that really spoke to me. Um, you know, it's like, you know, the, first of all, the burden shouldn't be on women um, because the rapists are the men, generally speaking. I mean, 90 plus percent of the time. Um, but yet it's somehow the woman's burden, like on both, both ends. Uh, it's just gross. But it reminded me of, of this poem. Um, this, is the, this is the low point for Medusa. This is page 48. And it's a um, note from the nadir. No savior awaits. These men are predators and every girl doomed to be consumed by their smoke and mirrors. I'm testing the edges of shards with my hand, guessing the distance between cold silver, steaming red. My life's been a feast of smoke and mirrors. Best to slice through that meat with my own hand, put some distance between real and pretend. Now that I know the hero I sought will never reach me, doesn't exist. Can I cut through illusion with my own two hands as swiftly and easily as my head sopped up what was fed? I'm certain the dream I chased never existed. There is no great epiphany. Yet my head still ingested what was fed. What can you do when part of the problem is you? You think there'd be some epiphany that the equation could be worked out in one's head but there's nothing you can do when the problem is you. Can you solve the problem of your head? Can you solve that problem with your head? Try to solve any problem in your head when the root of the problem is you. No savior awaits. These men are all the same. That problem lives in and beyond my brain. So thank goodness for sharp shards, steadfast hands. Can you solve the problem of your head? Can you solve that problem with your head? Try to solve any problem in your head when the root of the problem is you. <sighs> well, that's what they want us to believe as um, our friends at My Bad Poetry you know, pointed out. And mm -hmm. it was a very good read of that poem actually. Um, podcast, uh, <laughs> podcast, podcast plug. plug. Uh, both Lanny and I appeared on a podcast called My Bad Poetry, where we read our bad poetry, um, usually from like high school, college, uh, and then we read um, what we consider our good poetry now. And this was the poem that they picked for me to read, um, and they they had uh, they they really saw right to the heart of it. So um, shout out to them for that. So when I um, when I made that decision to go from writing about Zeus and his victims to writing about my own um, victimhood, survivorhood, whatever you you want to call it, um, it was a really difficult transition. I didn't know how to start having that conversation with myself, and like I would I would write a couple of things, and like it just didn't 
nothing was flowing. I was like, I can't, I can't do this. And then I decided to write about how I couldn't write about it, how I couldn't talk about it. And that's where this poem came from. Uh, this poem is on page seven. And whenever I do a reading, if I have enough time for this, I, I always include it because this is my personal favorite in the book. And I think that this is um, certainly the most emotional. I can't talk about it. My gut, that vengeful city of insomniacs, swaps tales of trauma with the loose twilight. Terrified of optimistic things like the sun, it drowns my sealed lips in caffeine. I survive on muddy irrigation and anxiety, hollowed and hungry, nibbling on fingertips that stretch for perfect words and refuse to let anyone within spitting distance of this soft underbelly. My tongue, that talented freight train, has been known to tap out the rhythm to anything goes, but when anything went, everything went, and I'm going anywhere and everywhere. Are you following? I can't talk about it. It's like a scream that keeps getting caught in my throat but the scream is a pair of men's hands and his cufflinks snag my vocal cords, just like his fingers snagged my closed eyes, dragging me from a piece I will never have again. My mouth, that deceitful poet, spoke forgiveness, but how can I forgive my skin collapsing in on itself? My bones drop away even as I stand here, and the only thing I can do to stay together is shove myself into pockets of an oversized sense of loss because I swallowed his apology and his three paintings of a single taupe flower as if jeering at the femininity he stripped from me, as if he knew this was the fifth time my, my body had been deadened in this way. My womanhood that lost and weakened wheel squeaks even as I weep to keep things moving along every day i am misrepresenting myself am i the apple the serpent or the whole damn rib cage protecting a man who refused to protect me for years i've been howling on the inside raking my soul red and raw with the need to tear this story out of my body and still I can't talk about it. I always, I mean, it's a terrible poem, a terrible like subject matter, I should say, of a poem, but the way that you read it and portray it is always so powerful. Um, so this is not the first time I've heard Lanny do this poem. So, so um, but I, I, it, it's, it's hard to say. I look forward to hearing it every time because again, it's, it's such a painful poem, but it's such an important poem because of that. I think I, I read it differently every time though, depending on how I'm feeling in that moment. So you get a, you get a different sensation. Flavor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, different, different flavor. Different nuance, different <laughs> spices each time. Um, but, but just a, a wonderful and wonderfully honest poem, um, no matter how painful. Um, so this also kind of talks about how it's difficult, um, especially when you're younger to talk about this subject. Um, this is page 21 of my book and this one is called Cheer. The only words I feel safe speaking, I scream alongside a team, combining them with sharp chops and kicks, a killer smile. Eleven girls and I devote our weekdays to memorizing litanies of victory, and our boys spring higher each year as if our words are manna. Atop the pyramid, held like a house on a rock, my faith never wavers. I feel the girl's mass will always lift me as it does the team, soaring, however briefly, above enemies, undefeated, untouchable, immaculate. And on the weekends, when I can manage to get away from him, I run far past the fence out back, hide my practice, a zealot casting spells, hoping the right words paired with the right actions will someday help me take some form of flight, recalling perfectly the patterns and tracks, 
vital when you're the only one who's coming to your defense. I think that kind of comes back to um, the women who aren't keeping other women safe um, and are enablers. Like we can only count on ourselves. And I think that that, that needs to change, which is one of the reasons why I published my book. Uh, I'm not sure if you feel the same way, Reagan, but like I, if it was just a matter of getting these poems out and being cathartic, I, I, I wouldn't have published it. Um, but the way that I thought about it was, I know that there are other um, people out there who have experienced this, other people that are feeling the way that I'm feeling, and I, I want them to know that they're not alone. And since I published Zeus, I've had women, because um, obviously like we know it's it's women and men that are affected as well, or you know people are affected, but the people who have come out and talked to me are are primarily women and um they've said you know thank you for these words i've i'm a, a survivor as well and your book helped me through it and that's that's the purpose so i'm just very thankful to have been in a place to get these words out and to continue to to spread um the message that you're you're not alone yeah um and in that in that light, um, I'm going to read Donne, which is a, another example of a victim continuing to be victimized. Um, Donne, page 81. Imagine a man so insecure, he precipitated his body into piss itself to impress a woman to impress upon her how potent he was, to press into her. Damp and lustful, Zeus slipped through a skylight into a locked chamber and within her lap. Maybe this worked less like magic and more like science, like evaporation, except instead of rising into a cloud, it was Donne. And that rain bore a son who would stone a woman whose only sin was being infiltrated by a man. Yeah, the, that, that ending especially, the, the only sin being infiltrated by a man, um, you know, that, that constant punishment and the, the, the people, men and women who participate in that, um, made me think of, of this, this poem, this is page 47, um, and just the sort of futility. So this would be on the other side of things if you are that woman, um, how you might end up feeling at some point, uh, being that woman, presuming you survive. This is called Relics. The first to set his sights on me after tried hymns, but the dissonance struck too similar, his chords always choked. The next pledged devotion, but another's portrait dropped from his pocket, his fingers perpetually outstretched. Then one came who tried to hide beneath my pain, but he didn't see the glass was already cracked, his fractures natural. But it's been so long and there have been so many. It's hard now to recall how it first felt to witness the twist seize skin like ivy, realizing I was the root. For a while, I'll admit I could live with hunting understudies. That seemed the best I could do, marked for this dark art, my nemesis too clever, avoiding this perimeter. I'd settle for some substitute for justice, torment other gluttons ignoring the warnings. I once wished a tender face could exist with me, but now I know better. Men keep advancing, the same gaze awaits, everything petrifies. This is no life. No one wishes for kisses that shock white. I once wished a tender face could exist with me. So the way that I am reading this is that this person wished that there was someone that could sit with them in this, this trauma, in this pain, um, and let them know that they've experienced it or that they're there, like just kind of someone to rely on. 
which is not common in my experience um not you know not having that support and so this one is heartbreaking <laughs> um you know if i didn't read it how you intended it it doesn't matter reagan it, <laughs> um that's it's what they're reading out of it. it's, everybody's <laughs> it's my poem that's right which is something that we talked about on um the the my bad poetry podcast is i i was asked you know does the intention of the writer matter and i said yes it does matter but once the poem is out there it's up for the interpretation of the reader and so it certainly doesn't matter that much <laughs> Um, not after it's published. But yeah, that's that's heartbreaking. Um, so my penultimate poem is on page 53, how to define depression. I am a noun. The last three movies I've watched depict nature and sexual violence, and I haven't figured out yet that I'm triggered like a motherfucker. I've been trying to speak for hours, but my lips are fish fading in the dirt. My wife holds my head in her lap and, and snot rivers from one nostril to the thigh of her blue jeans as I hiccup, hiccup, hiccup. It is proof of my vulnerability. It's all right, it's all right, she coos. But I am still afraid of appearing messy. I'm an adjective too. There is something broken. A moment ago, I was laughing. Now I'm a berry bush trying my best not to be poisonous. I think I am not good enough. And the sentence wraps my body like a ring toss again and again until I cannot tell the age of the rot. Sometimes I'm even a verb. I splash water on my face like a self-baptizing flower and wipe the weakness away. I can't help but consider it all a waste of time, intimacy, and the exorcism of pain when I could have been doing more productive things, like ridding myself of infected trees, like deforestation, like spray painting a bright red X on my bark. Yeah, that exorcism of pain. I, I that's part of that's one of my favorite parts of this this poem of yours. Um, and I I really like the way in this one that you explored um, sexual violence as a, almost like a subset of a word, thinking about how it's defined in different terms from that, the noun, the the adjective, the verb, and all of that stuff, and it all just kind of comes together in the singular um, body essentially. Um, I recently read uh, this book that I had on my list for a while. So this is by another survivor. It's called The Truth Is by Avery M. Guess. And um, there's a poem in here that kind of plays with sort of the, those like definitions and words in a different way, um, but that connected I thought well to that poem and, and depression happens to be one of the words in here as well. Um, one thing to know about this book, uh, the father was the predator, the mother in this book um, was uh, physical, uh, physically abusive towards the speaker. So this is the opening poem of that book and it's called The Secret Swallower Reveals Her Swords. Imagine the first time someone looked at a sword and thought, hey, I'd like to swallow that. Imagine the first sword swallower was a girl, not a man or boy like you've been told, just a girl from your neighborhood. Imagine she's been swallowing secrets for years, sees the sword and thinks that would be easier, more filling. But before she can swallow the sword, she has to make room, release her secrets. She opens her mouth, reaches in to pull out the first secret and finds it has become a broadsword. She calls it father and puts it aside. Next, she coughs up a fencing sword she dubs depression. She draws more swords out. 
names them after the secrets they carry, half a dozen, a dozen, two dozen, until she loses count and the clang of metal on metal no longer jangles her nerves. Imagine the last ones the smallest and hardest for her to reach, lodged in her heart as it is. A sword the size of a swizzle stick, the sharpest yet. Tugging it loose, she whispers, What did she whisper? I missed that. Mother. Mm. God. Imagine looking at a sword and and saying that that's easier to swallow than these secrets I've been holding on to. That I mean, felt very true to me. Yeah. No, like I, the the swords getting smaller and smaller, but like more dangerous and and pointier and that's an incredible poem oh my gosh um well who's the author again uh avery m guess avery. and also this is from a, a black lawrence press indie press indie press shout out the other one's from norton but you know it's marie Howe. we still love her <laughs> i i have to say that i i do love that this is you know this reading is is you and me um and yet you're bringing these other speakers in I just really appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess I've read a lot of people who've written about, well, there aren't enough people who've written about this in my opinion, but of the ones who have, I, I've visited quite a bit of work. So I think it's important to bring in other voices whenever yeah, I, absolutely. So I try to do that. Uh, so I have one, one more poem, um, which if, Hopefully uh, we have some horror movie fans here. Um, and if we don't, I do understand my that. My sister. Your sister? <laughs> yep. Do you know if your sister has ever watched I Still Know What You Did Last Summer? I'm pretty sure. Okay. She's seen them all. Well, ask her to read this poem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if, you, if you've seen the movie, uh, it's it's certainly a, a more in-depth read. If if you haven't, of course, you'll be able to, to pick up on it, but I'm a big horror fan. And so sometimes when I think of these horrible things that happen to people that it's kind of, I can't separate them really. Slasher flicks are often parables on lifelong healing. Page 71. I'm sitting on the couch watching a horror movie and eating pad thai with crushed peanuts, even though I'm allergic. So what if my throat shrinks when the one thing I really need to talk about is a decade old event that gets bigger every day? Words tumble in my mouth, clunky and expired like bodies in industrial dryer, like bodies in an industrial dryer, a memory looping, looping, I think about Brandy, and I still know what you did last summer, how her scream fell out with the dead laundress, but snagged at Mackay's spontaneous tracheotomy. Like Miss Norwood, I've developed calluses on my fingers from counting how many times I've relived a drunken summer party. How many times I had too many wine coolers washed down with agave flavored peer pressure. My throat closes up when I remember how I walked into that room voluntarily. His tongue, the only hook in my lip. Our clothes, the only dirty linen tumbling. Dreadlocked Jack Black was stoned when he died. Garden shears piercing his Hawaiian shirt. I too have been impaled while intoxicated. And I can tell you, senses are not dulled, but alive and kicking the sheets off the bed. Sometimes your friend is the man in the slicker holding an ice hook to your trembling body, daring you to move on from the previous summer. As I spoon rice noodles into a mouth only open for danger, I taste the sweet nuttiness of unmitigated risk and watch the credits roll. 
Yeah, that that line about being impaled, man. Wow. Like, yeah, it's and how it's usually someone you know, you know, being in this liquor, you know, just in disguise, basically, except they're not wearing masks in our real world. Yeah. So, um, but still, there that poem seemed, in some regards, one of the more hopeful poems. At least that's what I was hearing in that. Um, and since I mean, I haven't had an allergic reaction yet, to, <laughs> or I should say anaphylactic reaction. Yeah. So enjoy peanuts in moderation. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, if there's one hopeful poem in my book, it would be my last poem or well, no, I, yeah, it is my last poem. Um, and it's on page 70 and it's called Raven Father. So I wanted to read that one um, as, as the final pair to yours. You didn't make me Raven Father, unkindness did. You didn't see who split your girl too soon from the shell, couldn't hear the shivers of downless skin. You only ever saw me after these dark hinged wings, a double life already begun, one father, two masters, but sentry. I had none. I was so happy you sat with me, father, in the hospital. Diagnosis, half raven with two brains reining my head, flapping, falling back through memory, finding only endless twisted slacks. Half raven with black breast cracked open, blue tumor beating back forth, forth back behind viperous ribs. Unkindness, it seems, runs in this blood have sworn to each other struggle to fit incurably different. You asked me what I saw in my reflection once, Father, not knowing the tenor of your question. When I'd perch before a surface, I'd mostly notice shadows, what stuck with things beneath a shined light. You said, you can tell me anything. I'd waited two lifetimes for any man's kindness to reach me, and I returned it tucked words no bird should ever know under tongue. Fledglings can't be heroes, father. The small don't dare spring with unversed wings. They recite terms they've heard but can't grasp. Rattles demanding salvation, deliver us from. How swiftly a flock of unkindness will wisen us. Then we pray for age or an end, invent reticent melodies, peck and peck at our binding ties. You'd be so proud now, the sharp beak of mine. Split for collision, my halves now collaborate, fray unkindness's grip like scissors. Father, sometimes I saw your black pain flapping, but birds can never remain in sky. Why should I name who happened? Could that ever measure their infinite unkindness? Let me share these notes instead. Forgive what I've hidden in this odd soldered shell. Trust the blind flight alongside shadows I must shepherd. Your daughter's a crux, but resolved from the squall, oh, but recovered from the squall, resolved, shaping a haven with these pitchy songs. There is a lot that is just like bouncing around in my brain from this one. Um, You'd be so proud now, this sharp beak of mine. Um, just like having gone through these experiences and coming out with more angles, like sharper areas of the body, and like not being that that soft person anymore. Like having this knowledge is is how I interpret it. And I mean, that's true. We can't we can't go back to the innocence that we we once were and it just it speaks volumes um but i i definitely do see the the hope in this one um like why why bother uh dwelling on this you know let's move forward and i think that's it's such a great poem to end on it really is like i remember um my editor asked or it wasn't my editor i'm sorry i had an interview and they had read Good Morning to everyone except men who named their dog Zeus. And they said, I noticed that there's no resolution. Like you're going, you're going to therapy and yet there, there's no moment of, okay, I'm healed. And, it, and like, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. but that's what I got out of it. Yeah. And I was like, uh, 
there's no end. Right. <laughs> yeah. Here's reality. Taste <laughs> delicious, right? <laughs> there is healing, but that doesn't mean that there, you know, that you're going to be hundred percent cured or healed. Uh, and it's just, it's a process every single day to, to get over this trauma. And that's why I made this deliberate decision to not have the, oh, I'm cured. So I appreciate you having this moment of hope um, at the end of your book. Um, but it's still very clear that there is a lot of of healing that needs to happen, which is how it goes in reality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, no, I mean, good point too. And it's, you know, it's funny because I think people who ask those kind of questions, like they don't mean it like in a bad way. Like they just don't know because maybe they haven't had those experiences and they don't realize that it really is something that every, any, any particular day, you just never really know how you're going to feel and, but you feel and you get through it. Um, and that's just, that's the reality. So. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, I was just going to say that I, I had a friend who wanted to debate, um, Bill Cosby, like the, the whole thing going on with him and like how he got, how he got caught by, a a video or a recording that wasn't supposed to be used in court and how is that right or you know they're setting precedent and I was like I don't want to talk about this and he's like but just you know like should the court actually be used and I was like I don't I don't want to talk about this predator please stop and he's like okay right. but you know and I was like stop. and I don't talk to that guy anymore because stop yeah. pushing that narrative on me right. I don't want to yeah. talk about the predator who got put in jail with you know, information that was legal or not legal. I don't know. I don't care. I don't want to talk about it, but I'm glad that, you know, he got put away. And as soon as you said he, I was like, oh yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry, dudes on the, the call. I know you, yeah. you're probably really good dudes on the call. I don't know. Yeah, actually I do know the dudes on the call. I give them both thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's, it, it's not like we we want, or like, I speak for myself. It's not like I, I want to have my defenses up all the time when I hear he, or, you know, a, a man come in the conversation. I, I don't want to, I, I want to be, I want to go back to the innocence that we talked about, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, great ending poem is what I'm trying oh, to say. Nice. <laughs> same, same with yours. I'm glad that we ended on this kind of unresolved, but also somewhat hopeful kind of note. Um, I don't know if there are questions, but um, if people want to either unmute themselves or um, drop something in the chat, uh, now's the time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just no questions that I'm seeing, but just basic like, hey, I enjoyed the reading. I enjoyed the reading. Um, I had not had a chance to to read your book yet because, you know, I just got it a couple of months ago and my my daughter was born and life became a hurricane. Um, and I always wanted to read it, but I hadn't got a chance to yet. And so getting these pieces um, and and knowing where to start and like where I want to where I want to jump in now and the Sealy Challenge coming up. I think it's a perfect time to Woo! finish your book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and, and what it was interesting for me too, because my book is, is, it, it's a more or less chronological. So to be taking pieces from like beginning and middle and kind of mixing it up um, gives it definitely a different spin on it. So it'll be interesting to see what you think once you read it, at, like, as I guess intended or whatever. Yeah, I, I think it was done as Smith who asked on Twitter recently, like, y'all just read the book from beginning to end and that's it. Like you don't <laughs> go back and, <laughs> and they brought up a great point, right? Like you could read from front to back and that's one version of it. You could read back to front. You could just pick and choose um, that it's, it's great. That's why I love chat books. Um, and I know that ours aren't, they're a little bit bigger than chat book, but smaller books because you do have that opportunity to reread and and to just jump back into where like you maybe you want to read it a little bit more in depth and so I just really appreciate that yeah totally I just wanted to share um how much I appreciated so much hearing both of your incredibly um moving and vulnerable and um talented readings uh, really 
really incredible. And um, I'm a therapist and I work a lot with sexual assault survivors. And um, I would recommend both of your books um, to Thank folks you. because I, I do think it just speaks um, to the depth of um, the pain and the fear and the anger and the anguish, but in a way that's also so normalizing and connecting um, to others for people to, I agree with what you were, were saying earlier that, you know, a lot of people just feel like, oh, I'm not alone. It's not just me. And it's so powerful. And I know it takes a lot of courage to put yourselves out there to, um, to write in such authentic ways. And just wanted to thank you for that. No, thank you, Cindy. And, and really this, you know, like Lanny was saying about her book, I, I, that is my hope is that this book does reach survivors. Um, you know, one of the things that strikes me, um, now after this book has been out for a little bit, just a couple months now, um, is, you know, I, I'm also hearing from people, you know, that are reaching out and kind of sharing their stories or at least letting me know just vague in vague terms that, you know, they've had similar experiences, but, um, you know, when I was younger, um, and prior to, you know, hashtag me too, you know, people like, like you were really made to feel like this was only happening to you. Like it was very individual and, and th th it was just, you're this isolated kind of character having this experience and nobody else is having this experience. And it's actually the opposite. That's true. It's actually more people than not are having these experiences, but because of the way that we've been socialized and the way that, you know, patriarchy and sexism is just constantly ingrained in us, we are led to believe falsehoods that we are alone or we are isolated or nobody else is having these experiences, you know, it's our fault, et cetera, et cetera, all of those things. And so it's been um, eye-opening and educational for me um, as well, just having that experience and that dialogue now and just realizing, yeah, you know, actually I was never alone. I just didn't realize it because of all of the structures in place to make me not realize it, you know? That's right. To be able to perpetuate, you know, right. these dynamics, it's essential to silence mm -hmm. people. Um, and then people feel so ashamed and isolated um, that they're afraid to speak up and, you know, um, to be able to find each other. So these are the kinds of of books and and you know courage that it takes to to help people to find each other, which is like essential to healing. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you, Cindy. It it always comes down to representation matters. Yeah, for sure. I think Aaron dropped the question. What are you two currently working on, and how would you say the unresolution resolution affects your work moving forward towards forward following these two works? Um, I'll jump in first about that. Um, so I, I just want to say quickly that I have a, a book of, of fiction, um, short stories that dropped at the end of June uh, called Something Dead and Everything, which uh, which talks about grief um, in different versions of grief. I like to say that it, um, it discusses the intimacies, intricacies, and strangeness of grief. And I definitely want you guys to check that out if you, if you like fiction. Um, however, to speak to um, how the unresolution, the resolution affects works moving forward, I just had a chat book picked up called When the Forest Finds You. And it's another discussion about sexual assault, but using horror movie tropes. Um, so that'll be out next year. And when I, I realized that when I published Zeus that I wasn't quite finished talking about this, this topic. So I wrote When the Forest Finds You. And I think that I'm at that space in my, in that place in my life where I'm, I'm ready to move on from the discussion uh, or at least the writing of it. Um, I'm happy to, to continue discussing it with people who need to. Um, but I, I'd like to move on to some other things, but I wasn't, I wasn't done talking about it. So I had this whole new book that I, I wrote and it'll, it'll be out next, next year. Well, that'll be another one on my list. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm currently working on uh, my memoir. So it's from a very particular uh, space in my life that really doesn't um, relate to the subject of Head of a Gorgon, um, but relates to some time uh, when I was living in Las Vegas and dealing with a loved one's addiction. So um, that it's, it's very, I mean, 
I, in some respects, I feel more resolution on that subject than I do um, with respect to the content in Head of a Gorgon. Although, um, you know, again, there's never like this full like, and you're healed and, you know, it's all done. And, you know, it, it just doesn't work that way. Um, and, and really it is, you know, certain days I'm infuriated by things and certain days I feel sad and certain days it doesn't affect me really much at all, you know, and it's just, I don't know, I, it's, it's kind of weird. It's just like life, I guess. Um, we all have things that happen to us. Um, maybe not these things that Lanny and I are talking about, or maybe it is, you know, um, but, you know, I guess we just kind of keep going. Um, I don't, I don't know that I believe in any resolution really, period, with anything. <laughs> so, Thanks. Well, I think we've taken up a lot of Christina's time <laughs> and, and I appreciate and I'm so grateful that you let us run a little smidge over. Oh, this was this was such an incredible event. Um, so thank you both of you for sharing your stories and also as someone who's a, a survivor of sexual assault and also is obsessed with mythology. Um, it has been a deeply meaningful um, and cathartic 90 minutes. And I think you're both so brave for sharing these stories. Uh, and I'm so glad that that we have space. Um, and thank you for, for coming to a novel idea to do this event. Yay. I'm so excited that you, that again, that you have created this space because like I said, I'm not doing the in-person thing. Um, and so this has just been a tremendous um, opportunity and I'm just really grateful. Yes, thank you so much. And again, I can't wait to visit Phil Philadelphia so I can yeah, drop in day. and see the space in person. Yes, I can't, I can't wait for that. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Reagan. Thank you, Lanny. Um, what an incredible event. Thank you to our wonderful audience. Um, everyone who registered will get a, a link tomorrow, including both of you with the recording for this evening's event. Um, and I dropped direct links um, into the chat to purchase both of their books, but you can also just shoot us an email. We have both of them in stock. Um, and otherwise, I hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Um, thanks so much for being here, for sharing this space. And we hope to see you soon in whatever capacity that might be. And also congratulations to both of you on these amazing books. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for having them in stock so people can yep. actually see. <laughs> these exist. Yay. Yes. All right. Thanks so much. You, everyone have a great weekend. Rest of the weekend.